much combined choir. Jesus saves. Amen. Uh, you may be seated, and I shall not be before you very long. Uh, just to start things off, I want to share something that happened to me two weeks ago. Uh, actually, not to me, but to one of my coworkers. She actually had a baby. Uh, her real son's name is Oliver, but the rest of the teachers and I call him a certain different name. Uh, while she was pregnant, she didn't have any names in mind for her son, so we brainstormed a couple of things like William, Evan, of course I prescribed Mephibosheth and Belshazzar. Uh, one teacher brought something interesting about my coworker that led to this special name though that we all agreed on. Let's call this teacher who recently had a child, Stacy. She said, have you ever wondered that, haven't noticed that Stacy orders the, from lunch Harlem Shake and she orders the same side item every time? She could order a chicken sandwich, a burger, a hot dog even, and she always has a side of cheese fries. That's it. As a great team, we propose that his name shall be called Cheese Fry. <laughs> Jokingly, of course. Two of the other teachers and I were remarking on how cute Cheese Fry looked. We got a picture of him recently and wondered what his life would be like. I wonder how Cheese Fry would get along with his older sister. I wonder how Cheese Fry will do in school. I wonder if his mother will ever tell him that his coworkers called, her coworkers called him Cheese Fry. One teacher suggested, well, what if in 18 years we all go to Cheese Fry's graduation? We'd all sit in the front row and wait up for Oliver to be called up, and all of a sudden, as soon as he gets up, we're like, yeah, Cheese Fry! Woo! You did it. We're so proud of you, Cheese Fry! And he'd go back to Stacy and think, who are these strange people? <laughs> Why are they calling me Cheese Fry? Right? As we joked about this idea, things quickly became serious, though. We thought about what our lives would really look like in 18 years. Will we still be teaching at this school? Most said no. <laughs> will, we, will we even still be in the profession of teaching? Will we be living in New York? Will we even be alive? As a child now, children, you don't have these concerns right now. You're curious about the different jobs that are out there. Your future is bright. You want to be doctors, scientists, police officers, firefighters, teachers, astronauts, athletes, veterinarians, pilots. That's wonderful. And I think I can speak for the church and say that if you want to achieve any of these goals, we're behind you 100%. Amen. Amen. But as you get older, you may find yourself a little less exciting, like, like, excited Sorry, when you think about the future. I have all these goals. How am I going to accomplish all this? Or you may say... I have no goals at all. <laughs> How am I, what am I going to do in my life? How am I going to earn money? You may even begin to second guess your dream and say, well, I wanted to be a doctor, but that's when I was six. I really didn't think it would take so much like grad school, me I mean, medical school, undergrad, and playing off all these loans. I mean, I was six, and this is expensive and tough. I don't know if I can really do this. Usually when we have these thoughts, our anxiety starts to build, and suddenly that excitement you had when you were 10, then you wanted to be 16, and you want to be 21, and you look back and you're like, whoa, where did the time go? The future doesn't look as bright because we don't know what the future holds. There is a verse in the Bible that talks about the importance of having vision. Proverbs 29, verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Now, a common interpretation of this verse is that we need to get a vision because without one, you will perish or fail. Now, there is some merit to this interpretation because if you don't have plans or goals to work towards, then you will most likely find yourself suffering and worrying along the way. Say, for example, Aesop's fable, um, the ant and the grasshopper. During the fall, of course, the ant is conscientiously focused on gathering food and harvesting for the win during the winter, while the grasshopper is looking at him flabbergasted, like, why are you tripping? <laughs> There's so much food around here, and you're stocking them all up. There's plenty of it. I don't have to worry about that. So he's gleefully hoppling along. So he continues to waste his time and mock the ant. Then when winter comes, the ant is comfortably sitting at home with all his food saved up while the grasshopper is searching for food, <laughs> but he can't find any. Moral of the story, be prepared for the days ahead. But this isn't what... Proverbs 29, verse 18 is teaching. Just because you have a vision does not mean you are automatically guaranteed for success. If you go outside right now, you get a basketball, you look up at the hoop and say, I see this ball going in, and you shoot it, doesn't mean you're going to make it in. 
companies and businesses that had visions of how they would impact the market and provide excellent customer service that no one else had been defeated by competitors and have gone out of business. Presidential candidates that have seen the vision of holding the presidential office of these United States making changes to revitalize our economy and uphold our constitutional rights and improve our foreign policy. You should, you've heard it all before, right? They've all conceded and have ended their campaigns. Having vision does not mean that you won't perish. Rather, the vision referred to in this text is one that is prophetic in nature. In the Old Testament, the Lord used numerous prophets who spoke to the people on his behalf. God gave these men prophetic visions to instruct his people on how they should live their lives. Usually these were words of warning, urging people to repent so they would avoid perishing. Today, the vision that is referred to in Proverbs 29, verses 18, verse 18, the vision that will keep us from perishing can be found in the Bible. It is the word of God by which we learn the way of the righteous because, of the, because the way of the ungodly shall perish, according to Psalms 1-6. It is the word of God that provides the knowledge that we need because people perish from this lack of knowledge, according to Hosea 4, verse 6. It is the word of God that reveals Jesus Christ, the one who should, we should believe in so that we will not perish but have everlasting life, according to John 30, verse 15. It is the word of God that reveals to us God's character, indicating that he wills that no one should perish, but that all should come to repentance because, based on 2 Peter 3, verse 9. While it's important to have goals, dreams, and aspirations, these can't be sustained solely on your plans. Mm. Matthew 7, verse 24 to 29 tells us of two architects who build their houses on different foundations. One chooses the sand, while the other one chooses the rock. When the rains came down and the floods came up, thank you. The house on the sand had a great fall or went smash, but the house that stood on the rock stood firm. When we trust in our feelings, our thoughts, our perspectives, our desires, our plans, our strength to guide us, we're like the architect who stands or trusts in the sand as his foundation. We're bound to fail. However, when we take the word of God and rely on his feelings about us, his thoughts, his perspective, his desires, his plan, and his strength to guide us, we will not perish because we are living in his vision for our lives. Today, we will hear from several speakers who will elaborate on this vision for us from his word. I pray that we not only hear the words that are said, but we receptive and believe in the vision that he has for our lives. God bless you. afternoon, everyone. I must first give thanks to God, who is the head of my life. I greet my pastor, Pastor Reed, Minister Reed, all the officers, brothers and sisters, visiting friends, and the young children in the house of the Lord. The topic I, the topic I chose from the vision and doctoral statement is, we declare that God created the heaven and earth, and all things are subjected to him. We are his workmanship. We can break this down into three sections. God created the heaven and earth, all things are subject to him, and we are his workmanship. When I first looked at this topic, I thought, hey, this won't be too hard. I was wrong. I'll explain. The first part of the topic comes from Genesis 1, verse 1. We should all know this, Christians, yes. Which says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. But what I realized about this statement is that this 10-word statement is one of the most challenging concepts that confronts the minds of the past, present, and I do not doubt that the future minds will question this as well. It is so simple, yet so hard for some to believe. And why? Well, because of science or what people think is science. Some people believe in the Big Bang Theory, where there is this belief that there was a sudden explosion and the universe just came to be. But don't you think to say the universe just happened requires more faith than to believe that the almighty God is behind it all? Amen. Others say God got it started 
and the rest just evolved over the, the many, many years. That brings us to the theory of evolution, with the famous theory that we humans evolved from monkeys. As Bible-believing Christians, we must reject theistic evolution. Let me explain what that is. So theistic evolution is where we give a little bit of credit to God for starting it off, but then we believe that we just evolved from what, um, to what we are today, and God had no part in what we became today. So we must reject this theistic evolution because it denies the biblical ev revelation that ascribes to God an active role in all aspects of creation. In other words, God did not just start it off. He plays an active role in what is created today and everything that is to be created. Amen. Now, almost every religion has its own story to explain how the world came to be. Almost every scientist has an opinion on the origin of the universe. But only the Bible shows the one, um, the one almighty and supreme God creating the earth out of his great love and giving all people a special place in it. But why create the universe? God created the heavens and the earth as a manifestation of his glory, majesty, and power. God created the heavens and the earth in order to receive back the glory and honor due him. God created the earth in order to provide a place where his purpose and goals for humankind might be fulfilled. God created Adam and Eve, and this is our species now, in his own image so that he could have a loving personal relationship for all eternity. God didn't have to create the universe, but he chose to. And yet, we have a world full of doubters. For the children in the room, let me help you to explain, help you to understand what I'm talking about. So let's say you did all the chores in the house. You took out the trash. You mopped the floors. You cleaned the dirty toilets. But then someone else goes and takes all the credit. <laughs> it's a little bit like that, where God did all the work. He created the, uni the whole universe, and science tried to so hard to deny God and take the credit. Just to clarify, I'm, I'm just generalizing. I'm not saying all science is bad, so don't go to your teachers and tell them that. I said, I do not. I am for science when it is curing diseases and doing great things for our planet. But when science decides to come at our belief, we must stand firm in what we believe. I do. Because there is nobody that is going to tell me that I came from a monkey. You can try and convince me, but you will fail. <laughs> because I have a belief that I am special because like all of you, I am made in the image and likeness of God. Amen. Don't reduce God's creation to merely scientific terms and forget that God created the universe because he loves us. We will never know all the answers to how God created the world, but the Bible tells us that he, God did create it. Ecclesiastics 12 verse 1 says, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the ev evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. So if we have a belief that what the Bible says is true, then we can believe that God created the heaven and the earth. The next point that I will touch on is all things are subjected to him. Colossians 1 verse 16 says, For by him were all things created, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. By definition, subjected means being under dominion, rule, or authority as of a sovereign state or some governing power, owing allegiance or obedience. Now, don't mistake this as Christians being slaves to God, because that's not it, because of the mere fact that God gave us free will. He gave us the free will to choose right from wrong and to believe or to not believe. Amen. But we are under his dominion, for he is our creator. Amen. Like a sports team answers to, a, to their coach, or students answer to their teacher or principal, or employees answer to their boss, Christians will answer to God on the day of judgment. Amen. He created us for a purpose, and that is to praise him. But he will not force anyone to do so. God didn't have to create us, but he did. He didn't have to make me, but he did. And for that, I believe that I must let his will and not my will be done. Amen. The last point is, we are his workmanship. Ephesians 2 verse 10 says, 
For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. The word workmanship can also be looked at as masterpiece. God is working out in our lives a tremendous exhibition of his wisdom, his power, his love, his life, his character, his peace, and his joy. He's teaching us, training us, bringing us along, applying the paint in exactly the right places, producing a marvelous masterpiece to put on display. This is, this is to result in good works, kindness, love, mercy, compassion, help one another, meet, meeting one another's needs, um, found in the Beatitudes or as we follow the Ten Commandments. Paul says that God has prepared these works beforehand. Jeremiah 29, verse 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Amen. God is working on us. He is, he's working on me. And though we may go astray, he will never leave us nor forsake us. So what must we do? Well, I'll tell you what I am going to do. Well, in a world that is getting more scientific with each coming day, I must stand firm in what I believe and not alter or change what I believe due to some new scientific discovery. I encourage you all to do the same. So as in terms of what I believe, I believe that God created the heaven and the earth. I believe that as his creations, we are subjected to him. And I believe that we are his workmanship made in his image and likeness. Thank you. to greet God who's ahead of my life, Bishop Reed, Brother Kavars, ministers, children, and vis visitors in the house of God. My theme this afternoon is we declare that we are born again. When God created Adam and Eve, they were created in perfection. They were able to commune and have fellowship with God. They were able to commune with each other. They were able to walk and talk with him. They had that one-to-one. -one. But when Adam and Eve sinned, that fellowship was destroyed. Have you ever had something come between you and your best friend that made you lose closeness, trust, and that bond? Mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of what happened between Adam and Eve and God. Even though we messed up, God always wanted that relationship. I mean, that was the very reason he created us but sin led them into a different course of action. Well, God still longs for that relationship. That's why he gave his only begotten son. John 3, 16 states, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The purpose of being born again is to bring us back to God, bring us back into that closeness, being born again is a necessity because according to Romans chapter 3, verse 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. There is no other way, no other way to get back to God. Hallelujah. We must be born again. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but not everybody wants to be born again. When people die, when people die, you sometimes... When people die, you sometimes hear, oh, they went to a better place. This is not true. If you're not saved, you have not gone to a better place. Because I am born again, I look at life from a different perspective. Because I am born again, I think about relationships and friendships differently. Even to the point of how I work and treat patients, is because I am born again. God is the reason for this change. He has changed my life for the better. This society is set up to make Christians keep their mouth closed. But now is the time to declare. I propose to share this biblical truth with others by being the message. I want to be the message so when someone looks at me, 
they can say, there goes a child of God, through my demeanor and speech. I also want to study to show myself approved so that I can defend God's word with confidence. I leave you with this scripture from Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of age. I declare that I am born again. Are you born again? If you are not, I implore you to believe and receive. God bless you. Thank you, Sister Chantel. Thank you, Sister Krista. Thank you, Brother Carol. We've just answered three of the most important questions of human existence. Who am I? Why am I here? And where am I going? Who am I? I am God's workmanship. Where am I going? Depends. Are you born again? <laughs> right? And why am I here? I'm here to show forth the glory of the one who has made me. How do I know God's will? His will is found in his word. And when I have his word, then my, vir my, my vision will lead me to eternal life. But my vision, my man-made vision, I can hold it and I can still perish. That's awesome. That's, that's great revelation. Please put your hands together for the past three speakers. It's awesome. Praise team is going to lead us in the singing of I'm Yours, Lord. After which we'll have the next three speakers, Sister Maurice and... Sis Next two speakers, I'm sorry. Sister Maurice and Sister Tishai. I'm yours, Lord. I'm yours, Lord. Everything I am. Everything I'm not. I'm yours, Lord. Try me now and see. See if I can be completely yours. I'm yours. I would like to give honor to God, honor to Bishop Reed, all the other ministers. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'll be talking about or speaking about salvation plan for the entire human race. And looking at this topic or researching this topic, talking to friends and family and reading the word, I realize that there is so much to the plan of salvation. This relationship between God and man is of paramount importance to God. Creation shows this to be true. The first thing God gave man was his image and likeness because that was the first thing God wanted man to have. The second thing God did was to place man in his presence, which is the meaning in the Hebrew language of the word hidden. Therefore, God's greatest desire was that man act like him and live with him. The word image means resemblance or exact likeness. Therefore, to be made in God's image means that man resembles God, man resembles God and is an exact. In the scriptures, the word heathen refers to the place of God's presence. This can be found in Isaiah 51 verse 3 or Ezekiel 28 verses 13. So God gave man his nature and then put him in his presence. These were God's priorities. God did not establish reverent patterns, religious traditions, or religious activities in the Garden of Eden. There was simply a relationship between God and man. Establishing and maintaining this relationship continues to be God's primary concern. 
He is much more concerned about our fellowship with him than about our works, our activities, our tradition, and even our busyness. God wants a relationship that's the bottom line. And everything that God, everything God established for man was built on this desire fellowship. However, we see that after the original plan of salvation, I myself also learned that there's plan B. After man sinned, after Adam sinned, that was when we have to draw for plan B. The Bible says in Romans 5 verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Once again, Adam sinned. The entire human race was condemned from that point on. We were without hope. We needed a savior. The good news is that God had a plan from the beginning of time to give each of us the opportunity to choose if we would spend eternity in heaven with God or spend eternity in hell. His plan was to send his son Jesus to earth to die on the cross for our sins. God's plan is to save his people from their sins and to bring people fully and finally to himself. Matthew 1, 21 and 2 Timothy 2 verse 10 tells us about that. Christian experience salvation in this life in both past and present sense, and we anticipate in a future sense. Christians have been saved from the penalty of our sins. We are currently being saved from the power of sin. And one day when God's plan of salvation is completed, we are with Christ. We shall be like him, and we shall be saved even from the very presence of sin. Amen. This is God's plan of salvation. Amen. How has this plan of salvation impacted my life? One, I wanted, a relation, I wanted a relationship with God, and therefore I had to learn, first learn how my sins can be forgiven. The plan of salvation offers just that. Some actions that I take include accepting that I'm a sinner. Everyone is a sinner. No one can earn or work their way to heaven. Romans 3.10 tells us that there is none righteous. No, not one. Second, accept that as a sinner, there is penalty for my sins. That is eternal separation from God. It is spending an eternity in hell. Romans 6.23 reminds me that for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Also, accept that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. Jesus was not a sinner, but he took my place and paid the penalty for my sins. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he had made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Another great step I had to take is to put my complete trust in Jesus Christ and accept by faith that what he did for me. When we believe in Jesus Christ, we realize that there is nothing we can say or do to get us to heaven. The blood Jesus Christ shed on, on the cross has the power to cleanse us from all sins. And Romans 10, 13 tells us that for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that if you shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shall be saved. Romans 10, verses 9. Now, how can I share this biblical truth with others? What must I do to be saved? Acts 16.30. Well, I'm glad you asked. This is, in fact, the most important question that anyone can ask. We are troubled not only by the evils of our world, but also by our own faults. We, are of, we often feel guilty for those words and deeds that our own conscience tell us are wrong. However, God is always calling out to us with his incredible good news. With his hope that lasts way beyond this life and with divine love for us. Once you trust in Jesus, there is this amazing peace, joy that comes from him. Even with the pain and tragedy of this life. I've been to churches that, you know, they roll or just quickly run through the plan of salvation. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and live God. Be baptized and live godly. Now, I like to see proofs. I want you to show me 
where I can see all of this step. Not just tell me, but also show me. And if I'm going to tell somebody about this, I have to go prepared and know, show them that there is evidence. I'm not just telling you, but I'm also showing you from the word of God that this is what you need to do. Everyone can experience this peace, joy, and love of God. First step is to hear the word. In Romans 10, 14, it says, How shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe him who they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? The second step, you must believe in Jesus Christ as God's son and receive Jesus' gift of forgiveness from sin. God loves each of us and offers us salvation. You have done nothing to deserve his love and salvation. God wants, us, wants to save us, so he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross, hereby guaranteeing salvation for all who would repent of their sins and believe in him. Hebrews 11, verses 6 says, And without faith, it is impossible to be well-pleasing unto him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that seek after him. So after you have heard the word, Believe what you have heard. The next step is to repent or admit to God that you're a sinner. Understanding that everything, everyone needs salvation. And I love this definition of sin. It says sin is a refusal to acknowledge God's authority over our lives. The Bible says that all of us have sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23, but we're also reminded that the wages of, of sin is death, Romans 6.23. And believe me, that's bad news. But the Bible also says while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He gave his life on the cross for our sins. He was raised again on the third day. He now sits at the right hand of the Father. The Bible goes on to say, for God so loved the world, so loved you, that he gave his one and only son, Jesus, that who ever believed in him would not perish but have eternal life, John 3, 16. The fourth step is to confess in your faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved, Romans 10, 9 to 10. Final step, the fifth step actually, is that you have to be baptized for the remission of your sins. Mark 16, verses 16 said, He who believes and be baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Finally, you are to remain faithful as you walk with Christ. Revelation 10, 2, verses 10, remind us to fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some, some of you into prison, that he may be tried. But he have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. God bless you. Praise the Lord. First, I want to greet the Holy Spirit, who's the head of my life, and then to our bishop, to all the ministers, to the choir, to the congregation, uh, greetings in the mighty name of Jesus. My topic today is, I believe no weapon formed against us, me, shall prosper. Isaiah 54 and verse 17 declares, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. I'll share a story with you. This is one of my mom's favorite scripture. Every single day, she would always repeat this. I'm like, I didn't understand what it meant at the time as a young girl growing up in Jamaica. She would come into the room at night, and she anything that happened to us, she would be like, no weapon formed against my children shall prosper. Nothing. No, she would always say it. And I thought she went crazy when she actually painted the scripture on the front of the house. Everyone in the neighborhood was like, your mother is going crazy. Why would she put that up? But we did not have that eyesight. We had no idea what it meant. So we were just looking at it as her being crazy. 
You know, I thought like many, she definitely had lost her mind. Yes, we lived in a tough neighborhood, but they would never hurt us. We weren't a part of a gang, and I almost never got into fight with anyone. But I doubt this scripture was only speaking of those weapons that were readily, um, that are able to readily identify like a gun or a knife. I thought that's what weapon meant. That's the only thing, weapons. But 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 4 tell us, for though we walk in flesh, we do not war after the flesh. And that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to pull in down of strongholds. I believe that as children of God, we are constantly under attack. The devil has an arsenal of weapons he will use to try and hinder the work of our father. And some of these weapons are not seen without seeking the Lord diligently and being open with him about our situation. Weapons, fear, that's a weapon. Re rebellion, that's a weapon. Pride, that's a weapon. Fleshly desires, weapon. Anything that can go against the work of the Lord. While we may be under attack by the enemy, we should not be afraid because Ephesians 6 and verse 13 tells us to put on the, old, the whole armor of God. What is the whole armor of God? What does it look like? This is praying, reading the word of God, fasting and praise. And for us not to worry about what the devil will try to do next. Why? We are protected. We are covered. And the devil does not have the authority to harm us. Praise the Lord. This scripture has made an impact on my life. I have learned that I cannot have a relationship without reciprocity reciprocity, which is I have a role to play, which is to spend more time praying, fasting, and reading the word of God, and to rest assured that he will take care of me. He will let no harm come to me if I obey his word, and that I should not walk away from his love and protection because the devil is always on the prowl. He's always there. He's just ready to grab us as soon as we walk away from the presence of the Lord. How, how do I propose to share this biblical truth with others with whom I interact in the future? I believe that when I lived in sin, I was not guaranteed this coverage. Yeah. Yeah. Now that I have, not, now I don't have to worry about who is going to fight for me and who is going to protect me from my enemies. And I'll close with this scripture, 2 Samuel 22 from 3 to 4. The God of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my savior. Thou hast saved me from boilers. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemy. God bless you. Thank you, Sister Maurice and Sister Cheshire. These are awesome presentations. Jesus Christ is our security. Amen. We're secure in salvation. First of all, we're secure in salvation. That's fire insurance, okay? And secondly, we're secure through the blood of Jesus Christ that's able to protect, protect us from every weapon, both, both uh, physical and spiritual. These are awesome presentations. Thank you both sisters. We'll now do the song Jesus Be Offense, after which we'll have our last two speakers. Jesus, be a fence all around me every day. Jesus, I want you to protect me as I travel along the way. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Be a fence all around me every day. Jesus.
Thursday. Thank you for allowing us to come into your house another day to worship you and to praise your name. Thank you for the word that the words that have been spoken, and thank you for the words that I'm about to speak. I'm asking you that you will speak through me and allow us to hear uh, your word and to receive it and to put your word to work. In your name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so greetings to everyone in the church. Uh, everyone in the last room. Um, Pew, Pastor Reed, Evangelist Grant, Minister Kavar, Minister Paul, everyone here. Firstly, I'd like to give honor and thanks to God for all of his many blessings. I'd also like to give thanks for the privilege of standing here today to share with you all. I will very briefly speak on the topic, they shall be the head and not the tail. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 13 states, and the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail, and thou shalt be above only and thou shalt not be beneath, if that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. It is very important that we internalize this declaration because this is a very self-empowering and authoritative statement. What does it mean to be the head and not the tail? This statement is saying that with God's help, we are confident that we are equipped to excel at whatever task is put it to us, put in front of us, as long as we are walking in accordance to God's word. The statement implies that God wants us to be prosperous and that we will be, that we will be prosperous when we live under his terms. How do we know this? We see proof of this in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, which reads, now the Lord has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Because Abram chose to follow God's instructions, God gave him great wealth. And we see that in Genesis chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. It reads, And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him to, into the south. And verse 2 says that, And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. So this uh, verse just shows that when we, when we live under God's terms, uh, we, we are destined for greatness and that he will, re he will reward us. God has definitely revealed this truth to me through my own personal life experiences. I thank God for my two parents and wonderful family who have always reminded me to prepare and pray before taking on any, any challenge. Whether it be in the classroom or on my high school football field before a game, I always pray. I'm proud to say that I've always been among the top scholars in my class and among the best athletes. And it's no coincidence, I'm sure that it was because I chose to put God first. How would I go about, oh, oh sorry. I'm sure that it was because I put God first. How would I go about telling others that, about being the head and not the tail? I would do this by emphasizing the abundance of peace and comfort that I feel in situations where other people would be stressed or frustrated. Because of the benefits of, because I've seen the benefits of living under godly terms firsthand, it is my obligation to spread the news to, to, to both people I know and people that I do not know yet. I will tell a person that I do not know of specific examples of how I've seen God allow some of my close friends and family members to prosper financially, spiritually, mentally, and mentally because of their decisions to sub submit themselves to God. And I believe that once we submit ourselves to the will of God, he will b bless us bountifully as he did Abram. Thank you and God bless.
Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Praise God. This morning, this afternoon, I greet the church in the name that is high above every other name, the name which brings healing and deliverance, the powerful name of Jesus. Greetings, everyone. This afternoon, I'm not only grateful to be in the land of the living, but I am grateful that I am living and Jesus lives inside of me. For many today are in the land of the living, but are men's most miserable. Men most miserable without hope. It's nothing good that I have done, but it's only because of the grace and the mercies of Almighty God where I am able to stand before you. Praise God. Uh, our vision and doctrinal statement, we repeat it every session that we gather. And most times, or sometimes, the worship leader might say, we'll now do our vision and doctrinal statement. This is what we believe in here at City of Faith, Church of God. And it helps to govern our Christian walk. In the name of Jesus Christ, we proclaim and herald the vision of City of Faith, Church of God. We will preach the gospel, practice and teach this sound doctrine of justification. I, in getting this assignment, um, well, one of my weaknesses is procrastination. I struggle with that and may the Lord continue to help me. So I got the assignment and I took a long time to respond and at least three topics I chose. The first three, somebody already took it. And so I ended up with the topic justification. It wasn't my first pick, but after dissecting this word, I was happy I got this topic. It spoke directly to me and I could definitely relate. What does justification mean? We use it interchangeably with the word vindicate. It means to be declared righteous. The moment that you were made righteous in the eyes of God. The law condemns us, but through Jesus Christ, we are justified. Sin is universal. We were not only born in sin and then immediately converted after birth, but we actually made choices which were sinful. In our nature, we have committed transgressions which makes us liable to condemnation. If you, O oh Lord, kept a record of our sins, O oh Lord, who could stand but you, but with you there is forgiveness. Psalm 130, verse 3 to 4. But God is the only God who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance, and he delights to show mercy. Micah chapter 7, verse 18 through to 20. We are caught up in the consequence of Adam's sin. Now we are all sinners. Just as through the disobedience of one man, the men, that many were made, right, made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, that many will be made righteous. Romans 5 verse 19. He, Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God. We had no merit on salvation. No claim at all, for it was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. But the effect of Christ's death and resurrection is that now all believers, once who, were, who were once condemned to die, are made righteous. We are accepted by God as righteous. How can a sinful person be just before a holy God? It continues to be the debate for many. Justification cannot be poured down a saint's life, but it comes when the saint believes, believes that Jesus, believes Jesus' sacrifice covers all our sins. How can a righteous God even consider us? We can't fathom it, but we believe it. Yeah. Believe is an action word. Amen. When we believe something, we have faith and confidence in it. We accept it. We know it is true. Romans 5 and verse 1 tells us that it is through faith that we have been justified. It's not by our own efforts, but by faith. How does this impact me? I am grateful for the sound doctrine of justification. Amen. Yes, I grew up in a Christian home, grew up in the church, but I had my share of failures. And so I too needed to be justified. I am grateful for the day that the Lord opened the eyes of my heart to the revelation of the truth of this salvation. Because I have confessed all my sins to the Lord, because I have repented of them all, 
because I do my utmost best to resist the devil and his devices and to live above a lifestyle of sin, today I stand before you justified. I have sinned the many times, but because of the blood of Jesus, because of my faith in him, today I stand before you as if I have never sinned. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Psalm 103 verse 12. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remember your sins no more. Isaiah 43 and verse 25. It doesn't matter if you haven't let me loose, but I stand before you today and I'm free. You might just be reflecting on all my failures, but I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and he had, has arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. As the bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as the bride adorns herself with her jewels. Isaiah 61 and verse 10. Unsaved friends, believers who just needed to be reminded of the fact, young people, today I share this good news with you that the Lord loves you. Today, if you're a sinner, whatever sin you have committed, there is a savior in the house. He loves even what you consider to be the ugly side of you. He wants to adorn you with his robe of righteousness. Jesus' blood can make the vilest a sinner clean. All it takes is faith to believe. Do you believe? Yeah. If you are a born-again believer... Every time you come across the word justification, whether it is in our vision and doctrinal statement or some other place, picture yourself in a robe, a clean white robe. Remember that your slate has been wiped clean. Your past has been erased and you are now wearing a robe of righteousness. Charles Wesley penned a song we know as and can it be? I share his sentiment. How can it be that the Savior could be so interested in me? You and I who deserved all hell could bring. It was I who caused him pain, yet he died for me. How is it that a messed up individual so scarred by sin can be made just? It took a miracle, amazing love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God bless you. Glory to Jesus. Glory to God. What can wash away of my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus, oh precious, is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other founts I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Why is it important that human beings get in a relationship with Jesus Christ? It's because Jesus gives you vision. Jesus gives you fellowship with God. Jesus gives you a sense of purpose. Jesus teaches you your true origins. Jesus gives you salvation. Jesus gives you security. Jesus gives you success. And Jesus gives you justification. Jesus makes you right before God. Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. Amen. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know
everybody ought to know. you father we celebrate you we give you praise and honor because you're wonderful you're our God we thank you Lord for the vision you've given to us thank you for men and women who are willing Lord God to follow it to live by it to live by it Lord to teach it praise God to flesh it out praise God to be able to declare this is what we believe and declare to the world thank you God this is not from us it is from you you are the architect and the designer it is placed by you and Lord we give you praise and honor even now as we declare your word in Jesus name praise God over close to two decades ago God gave us this vision and doctrinal statement for this congregation. It was strange to some people at the time. And some people criticize. It takes up too much time. It is lending this service. It is doing all kinds of... Some even dare to say it's man-made. The devil is a liar. But if you take time out to dig this word of God, and every time you repeat this truth of God, it sanctifies deeper and deeper in your heart. And there are persons who, because of their lack of understanding of what God is saying, they, they, they criticize it. But I want you to understand today that when I sat here, I, I, said, I said to myself, it's not a constitution. Yes, yes. God gave to the founding fathers a constitution. And scholars, lawyers come afterwards and they would spend time to go through and find the nuggets of truth. Some things that I saw that was lifted here from this today. When it was given to us, I didn't see them. But God has given us these wonderful minds. These students, children of God, were able not to put them in practice. Amen. May I say to you, every time it has been read, read it. Read it out loud. Because if it's not for you, it's for your children. For your children's children. And you're covenanting over your own life. Praise God. When you say things like, no weapon form against thee shall prosper. When you say, I believe in justification. When you say, I support the vision. When you speak these things, you're speaking them in the atmosphere and demons firm. But no wonder why some people can't even say it. Because it brings you to another level, you see. But I'm thankful to God for those who will take time to study it, to know it, to commit to memory, and say, this is how I want to live my life. I have life without a creed, without a vision and an aim, will be no life at all. You have to have something that you're aiming for. And that's why today I'm happy for Minister Reed, God bless her, as she thought about this idea of letting, letting the young people, letting the young people just, just take this and dig it. And just bring it forth today. Happy for those who volunteer. 
because it's a voluntary choice. And tonight we're going to even dig further. We're going to hear further. But I want to ask you a question because the gospel has been preached in so many ways. Is there anybody here who is not saved? You come and you hear these young people talking and talking and talking, but yet you have not given your heart to God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Abraham's blessing cannot be yours. You cannot faithfully covenant to be the head unless you're walking in God's favor. You cannot get, there's no guarantee outside of the blood of Jesus Christ. Praise God. So you've got to be in it to win it. This is not just repeating words. This is something you must commit to your heart. Commit to your life. Justification. Repentance. I am born again. I believe that God is the creator of the heaven and the earth. You've got to know it for yourself. As Christus and believe it for yourself because when you meet the, the humanist and the secular humanistic theory and they tell you you're from monkey you've got to say like Christa I am not I don't know where you're from but I'm not from monkey I'm from the species God made made in this image so if you are here today and you just have a, a, an outside relationship maybe you're not committed to God I want to pray for you God is developing more preachers. Something tells me that some of these people are going to be back on this platform very often. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Something tells me you're going to be back here very, very often. In the name of... But, but this, you see, friend, this is part of the vision that God has given to us. Hallelujah. To raise up men and women who are willing to take the vision and run with it. Not to alter it, not to cut it or trim it, but to say, I believe it, I receive it, and this is what I want to share. But there's room for many more. Today we only had six persons sharing in this service. We'll have more later on tonight, but there's a lot more to share. If you're here on this service and you have not yet had a relationship with Jesus Christ, or if you're scratching the surface, there's no guarantee outside of the blood of Christ can't properly articulate this vision unless it becomes part of you and you can only take somebody somebody where you have been so i'm going to open the altar now if you'd like us to pray for you whatever your needs are would you want to come in the closing moments of the service we're going to pray for all those who spoke today oh yes we've seen god use them i watched the response of the audience and i thank god the last presenter dramatized, changing the black robe and putting on the white robe of righteousness. You can't want a clearer word picture than that. My friend, if you're here today in sin and your life is messed up, God's what God will do for you. He'll change you from a, a dark path into a path of light. And God can only use a soldier he can trust not one person up here came to performance today. We are ministering. Would you like to be used by God? Would you like to change your way of living, your way of walking? Yes, it's appropriate that the young people come because it's young people Sunday. We never know what God will do through a life submitted to him. But hear me good, carefully. Unless you accept the Lord as a personal savior, if you die in your sins, you're going to hell. There's no middle ground. You must be born Membership in this congregation will not save you. Membership in a church will not save you. What will save you is the blood of Jesus Christ when applied to your heart. And right now, it's an open invitation for you. Would you like to be born again? If you're not, would you like to be prayed for? If you're not, if you have not yet come to a full acknowledgement of Jesus Christ, maybe you're a backslider. Maybe you once loved the Lord. You were walking with him. You had fellowship with him. But you've drifted away. I open this altar now for you to come. I want to pray for you. Anybody else? Could the church stand please? Anybody else? Maybe you have drifted. Maybe you have wandered. Maybe you have, you have not been praying enough. You have not been doing due diligence to the Lord. What a glorious opportunity to see this altar filled with young people, young children. I'm excited. You know why? Because they have a long life ahead of them. 
Hallelujah. They have a full future. And if, and if, if brethren, if they get it, church, if they get it, they can be the movers and the shakers of our future in the name of Jesus. So do not underestimate the power that lies in these young people coming to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. They are the ones who are the movers and shakers and if they get it and if they have a sound salvation, then our future is secure. Anybody else would like to come? I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes for this altar. Close your eyes, clasp your hands and close your eyes. You, you close your eyes because you want to shut out every distraction. So you want to see in your mind's eye, you want to see Jesus. What a joy. I feel a joy in my soul today. To see so many of them come to an altar. Mm. Hallelujah. Would you close your eyes and say after me, Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I come because I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner because of what the Bible says. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm a sinner because of what I have done. I have done things wrong. But I come to you now in Jesus' name. And ask you for your forgiveness. Cleanse me by your blood. Take away every sin. Cast them in the sea of forgetfulness. And help me as of today. Not to commit any wrong. Not to violate your law. But to live by your rules. I ask you now father. To cleanse me, wash me, make me whole from this day forward in Jesus' name. Amen.